Welcome to episode 4 of my new series of puzzle pieces. Today I'm going to be showing some of the most important markers of all on God's clock in the heavens. Hopefully my series here might help some others see just where we are at on God's timeline that he has set for us. What I'm mostly doing is showing signs in the heavens and talking about the facts of current events and some far past events. The most major signs in the heavens have been going on for at least 10 years, ever since those blood moon tetrads during the Jewish feast days back in 2014 and 2015. But then the blood moon tetrads have been marking the heavens all the way back to when Israel became a nation again. All these things I'm seeing are like fireworks and flashing neon signs in the heavens. And just like the woman at the well, I want to drop everything and run off shouting out what I've seen to anyone who has ears to hear and not allow God's messages to fall like silent raindrops echoing into a well of silence. I'll start with this capture from Stellarium that is just coming up on June 6th, the 6-6 date of all things, and we've got six of the luminaries all sitting in Taurus on 6-6. And as usual, this lineup at this moment is all clothed in the sun in pure white. So in order to see most of it, one would have to view the sky right before sunrise. And the moon will not be illuminated hardly at all. It will be what I call a no moon day. And the Jews will start their new month on June 7th. And Venus, what I see as the bride or church, will be totally hidden by the sun and not seen for a few days. Actually, she will be hidden in the blazing sun for a while. And I see Mars, known as the god of war, sitting right there on the band of Pisces too. D-Day, June 6th, 1944, exactly 80 years since the Normandy invasion, the largest seaborne invasion in history, codenamed Operation Neptune. Perhaps Mars is sitting right there on the band of the fish, here at the end of the age, to remind us about war. He was the seventh and final vial to get filled with God's wrath which happened exactly during the April 8th eclipse, which was John the Baptist's current birth date, star date. What's even crazier is that this date of June 6th would have been the day John the Baptist was conceived in 66 of 4 BC. And now we are looking at 66 of 2024. In a way, I feel that the day John the Baptist was conceived, God declared war on the Pharisees. Maybe that's why Zechariah never said a word about it for over nine months. So this is what today's episode is all about, showing all the signs surrounding the births of Jesus and John the Baptist. Before we get started, I also wanted to report that a sister warrior sent me a link to an article in SciTech Daily by NASA published just a few days ago about a somewhat rare planetary alignment on June 3rd where six planets could be seen all at once just before sunrise. And the article was saying that a full planetary alignment in which all eight planets would appear to fall into formation 
on the same side of the sun would be so rare that it might take 300 billion years to happen just once. Since this menorah formation has everything to do with the 313 birth date of John the Baptist, it's totally tied to this video. I explained it all in previous videos, and I'll be going through these signs in detail in the next couple of episodes, so just hang in there. It's very hard to talk about individual puzzle pieces without showing the other ones, but I think this article and what they are saying just proves how rare such an event as this really is. Now, I'm well aware that this complete menorah formation from 313 is all lined up in the sun. So it's not something that would be seen in our nighttime skies. It would be impossible for God to put his menorah in the heavens with the sun taking front and center stage and still have us be able to see it. But it makes sense to me that God's menorah of the seven, just as John describes seeing in heaven, is actually hidden from us behind the veil of the sun. But I've made some notes on this slide showing that not only were there our seven readily visible luminaries all lined up perfectly as God's grand menorah of the seven, with the sun taking of course center position, but we also have the other three there as well, Uranus, Neptune, and even Pluto in this scene over in front of Capricorn. The menorah mostly covers just the two constellations of Pisces and Aquarius, and then Jupiter is taking the position at that front foot of Aries, right where the sun was during the crucifixion. And a lot of people say that Jupiter does represent the earthly Christ, striped and pierced. So Jupiter is perfectly in position, just as the sun is in the menorah. And if you take into consideration all ten of the heavenly bodies, they are taking up four constellations, which is one-third of heaven. And we have to take into consideration that this is all happening in Pisces and Aquarius, at basically the exact timing of the end of the age of Pisces and the beginning of the age of Aquarius. I mean, if I was one of the three wise men, those Babylonian astronomers, I would be well on my way to Jerusalem right now. And when seeing what this article is saying about how rare these types of alignments are, once in 300 billion years. I don't think this type of alignment to perfectly occur and mark out the end and beginning of an age and in their respective constellations of those ages has ever happened. Ever. And you want to know what's even more mind-bending? This happened on John the Baptist's birthday, 313 of 3 BC. And this menorah happened on 313 of both the Gregorian and the Hebrew calendars, because it was also the third day of the 13th month on the Hebrew calendar. But I'll tell you what I think it's really all about. Genesis 3.13 Our defining moment. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So the subject of today's video is going to be covering the birth dates of Jesus and John the Baptist, 
and some connected events. I've gone over some of this stuff before, and I'll be adding some new material as well. So I hope you will hit the thumbs up and subscribe and hang out with me here. Since this is episode 4, if you feel confused about the shift in the calendar dates from Jesus' time to our current dates, or star dates and things like that, post your questions and be sure to watch the previous episodes. All the stuff in this series is sort of building upon itself, and I know in this one I'll be talking about the menorah formation of the Revelation 15 sign, and maybe the Revelation 12 sign too, but I haven't gone over them yet in this series. I do have some videos posted about it all on my channel from a few months ago, and I'll be going through these signs in the heavens that John said he saw in my next few episodes so be sure to check back soon. Maybe the easiest place to start is with the birth of Jesus. And keep in mind from my last video everything I was showing about that wedding ring eclipse and even Jupiter at that front foot of the Lamb in heaven at the very moment that eclipse first touched the U.S. at exactly 9.18 a.m and matching the 918 date of 3 BC. The wedding ring eclipse is a major confirmation of Jesus' birth date and year because it is all about Circumcision Day. So what's so important about Circumcision Day? It's the day Jesus first entered the temple in Jerusalem to make his Abrahamic covenant with God that's how important that day was, the first time Jesus entered the earthly temple. Luke also tells us about a widow in the temple on Circumcision Day, and the two blood moons that were exactly 84 years apart to the date were about that widow. And I'll make a separate video just talking about those blood moons and that widowed bride, Israel, in the temple. So anyway, I'll try to stay on track here. These are all the star date matchups for the original star dates and our current star dates, 9-11 of 3 BC, and our current date of October 7th for Jesus' birth dates. Like I was saying before, there is about a 27-day shift in our calendars since then, due to the procession. Circumcision is on the 8th day, so those dates are 918 of 3 BC and currently October 14th, the wedding ring eclipse day. War on Israel on their great 8th day of tabernacles last year, on Jesus' birthday and the eclipse on the eighth day later, marking Circumcision Day. This is the calendar for the year 3 BC, and you can see that they were blowing the trumpets for the Feast of Trumpets that year at sundown on September 10th. I've talked about it a few times before, but it's obvious when watching what the Jews are doing that it is tradition that when the sliver of the new moon is sighted, the trumpets are sounded for their New Year's, and it is then declared that day one of the new year has just ended. So the trumpets sound at sundown to begin day two. This point is easily seen in this year of 2024, because we have two eclipses this year, and both of those eclipses mark the end of the year on both their religious and civil calendars. There is no way that the first sliver of the new moon is going to be sighted at sundown during an eclipse. 
The trumpets would traditionally in history have been sounded on the next sundown and not during an eclipse. And that would mark the end of day one. This is exactly why Rosh Hashanah is a two-day event, so everyone can celebrate the new year in the fall for the Feast of Trumpets. In these three side-by-side -side screenshots, I'm showing the three dates at sundown over Jerusalem in 3 BC for September 9th, 10th, and sundown on the 11th. I've marked the western horizon line in red so you can see it better. And with the sun right next to the marks, it is right around sundown in these pics. As you can see, there is no way they could have spotted the new moon on September 9th because the moon set before the sun did that day. So they would not have been blowing any trumpets at sundown on the 9th. They would have blown the trumpets at sundown on the 10th, and that day, the 10th, would have been declared day one of the new year, Rosh Hashanah, and the Feast of Trumpets, at sundown on the 10th. So just keep in mind, with all the signs in the heavens that God has set for us, that Jesus was born on September 11th, which means that Mary probably went into labor when the trumpets sounded at sundown on the 10th. And Jesus was probably born before sunrise the next morning on September 11th, which would be his first day. And then on his eighth day, he was taken to the temple in Jerusalem for circumcision on 918. This is an overall view of September 11th of 3 BC. And one thing we notice right off is that it does resemble the Revelation 12 sign too, with the moon being near the foot of Virgo by the time the moon sets in the west that night. And then we've got three planets in the scene with the sun and the moon. I think another big confirmation is that during Jesus' birth and Rosh Hashanah that year, our king planet Jupiter, which is the earthly representation of Jesus, was in conjunction with our king star Regulus right at that exact time. Jupiter was in near exact conjunction with Regulus, right in the heart of Leo, for about three days during Jesus' first three days of life. None of this is going to happen during any of the other proposed years for Jesus' birth at the Feast of Trumpets. I've already checked out the dates for about five or six years. Plus, this is for sure the only year that Jupiter will be in conjunction with the king star Regulus during the birth of Christ. Remember from the last time? It takes Jupiter 12 years to make the complete circuit around the heavens. And we've already seen how important this bright star in the heart of Leo is to God as a marker on his clock in the heavens, the king star named Regulus. At the birth of Christ, we see the king planet in conjunction with Regulus for days. And during the crucifixion, we find Uranus, heaven in Greek, nestled in the heart of Leo right next to the king star. And then our first great American eclipse also occurred right near this star Regulus and beginning at Salem as well. And as we know, the Psalms in many places match up to years. And 2017 was Psalm 117. And perhaps where God has hidden some keys. In Revelation 14, 
John told us specifically about three angels with three messages that flew through the midst of the heavens overhead. And he told us what their messages were. It's no secret. They were speaking with loud voices. And the message of angel number one was basically Psalm 117. And John wrote exactly what the angels had to say to everyone. That was just before John spent the next 15 verses telling us about the Revelation 15 sign and the final 40 days leading up to the third mighty angel flying through the midst of heaven. It was the message we were given at the exact moment that the seventh and final vial was being filled with God's wrath. I think John wanted to make sure we got the message loud and clear before he told us what was about to happen during those 40 days of what I call Noah's flood of troubles. And just one more thing about all this. As God was setting up for the end of the year 777 for the Jews, and the number 777 is about completion and fulfillment. So to end the year 777 for the Jews, at sundown, beginning the Feast of Trumpets on September 20th of 2017, as you can see here on this calendar, God was setting up for the big Revelation 12 sign to end the third day. And the Revelation 12 sign happened at sundown on the 23rd, the day after the fall equinox too. And the Revelation 12 sign happened 33 days after our first big eclipse day over the U.S. and the message of the first angel. So look at this Stellarium screenshot. I'm showing sunrise on the final day of the year 777 for the Jews. And what do we see? As God is setting up for the big Revelation 12 sign, we see Venus in total conjunction with the king star Regulus in the heart of Leo on the last day of the year 777. I mean, what are the odds of all this? Venus, the church or bride, right in the heart of Leo, as God calls an end to it all. Oh wait, I almost forgot about this one. Exactly 33 years ago, which of course I think is very significant, there was a major conjunction at Regulus. In 1991, there was a three-way conjunction with Jupiter and Mercury and the star Regulus, which was setting the Watchman community at that time on fire, thinking that the rapture was about to happen. And this massively bright and rare three-way conjunction happened on 9:10 through 9:11 at the time back in 3 BC when they would have been blowing the trumpets and Jesus was born. This conjunction would have been viewable from Jerusalem on 9:10 and 9:11, rising east shortly before sunrise too. I looked up on the Hebrew calendar to see what was happening on those dates. And just as this great alignment was beginning, they were blowing the trumpets at sundown on September 9th for the Feast of Trumpets. September 10th that year was the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And then September 11th was the third day. It's no wonder the Watchman community was on the edge of their seats during all that. But we've seen a lot more signs in the heavens in the past 33 years since that day. And so many prophecies playing out before our eyes. 
including discovering so much of what John was telling us about in Revelation. But I still find it amazing that it's been exactly 33 years since this sign in Regulus. So this is a look at the calendar for last October of 2023. As you can see from my note at the top, after Anna's blood moon, which has everything to do with Circumcision Day, the longest blood moon in 33 years that eclipsed Uranus, heaven in Greek. 333 days later, the war began in Israel. On October 7th, Jesus' current birth date stardate. It was the great eighth day of tabernacles from John chapter 7 on the 7th and the second time John mentions Nicodemus with clearly a Greek name who was ruler of the Jews and a Pharisee. I think John uses Nicodemus, a man only mentioned by John in the Gospels, but he uses Nicodemus with the Greek name to alert us to some very key moments where he's dropping some major clues. The next chapter, John chapter 8, he starts with telling us that early in the morning Jesus again entered the temple. And because I already know that John is making some references here to the first time Jesus entered the temple on his great eighth day of life, which is the same star date of the second eclipse. John chapter 8 verse 8 is when Jesus stoops down for a second time and makes his mark upon the ground, just as he did with the second eclipse. And 8-8 eight, eight is how many days it took from that eclipse to get to January 11th that everyone keeps talking about the 111 date. And then, 88 days later, was the third eclipse of April 8th. This October 14th eclipse, on the eighth day after the war began, and matching Jesus' eighth day when he first entered the temple and shed his first blood. It is also referenced by John in Revelation 14, the eclipse of chapter 14 on the 14th. This is where John also says that he looked and saw a lamb which stood on Mount Sion, which in Greek here is the word for heavenly New Jerusalem. It's the same Greek as in Hebrews chapter 12 about the kingdom that cannot be shaken. I don't think I'll go into everything about the 144,000 right now. It's sort of a whole subject within itself and a whole nother piece of the timeline. But when reading these first words of chapter 14 on the 14th of October, I knew not to just look at the matchup of Circumcision Day, but to back out and look at that Lamb in heaven. And that's when I saw Jupiter, right on that front foot of Aries, in the same spot as where the sun was on Crucifixion Day. And this was exactly during the eclipse, as the eclipse would be passing overhead within minutes, and Jupiter would also be diving into the earth in the west within those same few minutes. I went over it quite a bit in my last video, so I think I'll move on to John the Baptist's birth dates real quick to wind up this video. It's really just simple math, and I'm just using the year of 2023 here because it's not a leap year with the extra day in it. If we take Jesus' birth date of 9-11 of 3 BC, and subtract the 182 days, then it means that John the Baptist was born on 313. 
That's the date of the menorah that I've been showing for months on my channel. The sign that's never happened before. As well as the very date of the Revelation 7 sign. And so far, I've been through hundreds of years on Stellarium. And I'll be talking about the Revelation 7 and 15 signs in my next two episodes. Also here, as you can see, if we take Jesus' current birth date of October 7th and subtract the 182 days, then we get April 8th. That is the date of our third and final Great American Eclipse, and also the date that the final vial number 7 got filled exactly during the eclipse. And as you can see from these screenshots, these are in fact the same star date on God's clock. And we also know how important this particular spot is on God's clock, since he set Jupiter in this exact spot during the crucifixion too. I've got lists of things that pertain to the 313 date, but these numbers and this date are tied to so many puzzle pieces that I'll probably just get to them as I move along in the series. About the only other real interesting thing I see on the very date that John the Baptist was born is on that very morning, Venus the Bride was sitting right in what I call the very heart of Aquarius. It's just something interesting to think about. For now, this is probably enough for this video, and I'll once again leave you with this pick of our upcoming date of June 6th, the very date in 4 BC that God conceived John the Baptist. And coming right up on the 6th, we see Mars on the band of that first fish of Pisces. And Mars is the red planet, and always known as the god of war, D-Day, and Operation Neptune. I do hear the sound of war drums on the horizon. June 6th will also be exactly 77 days since Venus the Church, or Peter, dove into those waters on the day after the equinox. And the equinox was seven days after the menorah formation of Revelation 15, when I believe they hauled in those nets. These screenshots are from the location of the Sea of Tiberias because I wanted to know what it looked like at sunrise on the sea that day. And definitely, by sunrise on the 21st, Venus is diving into those waters to join Saturn, and then exactly crossing the line at around 3.33 in the afternoon of 3.22. One thing I'll remind you of, if we count the fact that Jupiter was actually the first vial to be filled with wrath on 2.22.22. And as soon as he did, Putin crossed the line into Ukraine on 2.24.22. It took exactly 777 days for God to fill those seven vials of wrath. And now I'm looking at the D-Day anniversary and John the Baptist's conception date of 6-6 and 77 days after Venus dove into those waters. So I'm going to keep working on videos as best I can. And if I'm still here, my next videos in this series will be explaining some more about the Revelation 7 and 15 signs with some documentation. But after reading that article about not in 300 billion years, I'm pretty set now. Be safe, my friends, 
and keep looking up.